presentation by art historian and curator Grace Devaney. We are extremely thrilled to welcome Grace to Winnipeg, albeit virtually, as our first visiting curator Hello. in this in the School of Art Galleries, uh, or the School of Art Galleries exciting new visiting curator program. My name is Blair Fornwald and I am the director curator of the School of Art Gallery. For those who might be listening to this presentation only, I'm a white feminine presenting person in my early 40s. I have a short brown bob haircut, cat eye glasses, and I am wearing a white button up shirt with uh, brightly colored squares on it. And I'm in my office at the university. Although we are gathered virtually, this talk is being presented by the School of Art Gallery at the University of Manitoba, which is on Treaty 1 territory. University of Manitoba campuses are located on the original lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene people, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. Land acknowledgements are, of course, not constitutive of change, but they do remind us that change is imperative, and that we must dedicate ourselves to listening to and moving forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. As we are collectively grieving the countless lives lost to residential schools and grappling with the violence that is embedded in the very heart of colonial nation building, it is a particularly prescient time to demand the implementation of the 94 calls to action outlined by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and also to take stock of our collective and individual capacities to support reconciliation move towards equity and justice, and um, be kind and compassionate to one another. I would also like to acknowledge that the School of Art Gallery is generously funded by the University of Manitoba, the School of Arts faculty and staff, donors and volunteers. Programming support is also provided by national and provincial funding agencies. The Visiting Curator Program, this exciting new initiative is generously sponsored by Dr. Michael F. B. Nesbitt, whose contributions to art and community building are deeply felt throughout the city of Winnipeg and especially at the University of Manitoba. Over the next three years, the Visiting Curator Program is going to support curatorial research, exhibitions, events, and publications by Grace Devaney, as well as two emerging curators who Grace will mentor. The Visiting Curator Program will play a vital role in defining contemporary art and its attendant discourses in the prairies fostering strong new voices in this field and providing students, faculty, artists, and other community members with meaningful opportunities to engage. We are extremely grateful for Dr. Nesbitt's vision and his gift, and we are thrilled to be launching this program tonight. And of course, we are ever grateful to Grace for speaking with us tonight, and we are so happy that she has accepted our invitation to participate as our first visiting curator. Grace is Associate Curator of Prospect 5, Yesterday We Said Tomorrow, which is the fifth iteration of the Prospect Contemporary Art Triennial, which will open, I believe, on October 23rd, 2021 in New Orleans. Previously, she was Assistant Curator of the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago, where she curated exhibitions, including Christina Quarles, Direct Message, Art, Language, and Power, and Groundings with Tara Aisha Willis, as well as presentations on the work of Paul Pfeiffer, Amanda Williams, and Anya Jaworska. She is a PhD candidate in art history at Northwestern University, and her dissertation research looks at television and technology of the 1970s to 1990s, and in the works of Howardina Pendel, Tony Cox, and Stan Douglas, and the ways that these artists created counter narratives to popular representations of Black political thought and action. Often exploring the relationships between landscape and language, Devaney's research explores how representations of places we live and the language that is used to define our experience is challenged or reconsidered by artists. Before I turn it over to Grace, I would like to note that this call for emerging curators to participate in the Visiting Curator Program is open now until July 23rd. And it is a really fantastic opportunity for two individuals to receive mentorship and guidance, as well as financial support to launch ambitious and exciting exhibitions, programs, and publications at the School of Art Gallery. Um, if you are an emerging curator, please consider applying. Um, and if you're not, please consider encouraging the brilliant emerging curators that are in your life um, to apply. And you can find out more on how to do that by visiting our website, um, which is umanitoba.ca slash art slash gallery. And um, finally, the, uh, the Zoom housekeeping notes section. Uh, I just wanna remind you that this talk is being recorded and it's also being live streamed um, on YouTube Live. 
So I'll just ask that, I think everybody's got their cameras off, but I'll just ask that your cameras are turned off and your mic is muted for the presentation. Um, we have ASL interpreters available. Um, their names are Christina and Shannon, and I just wanna thank you both for your valuable service. Um, we also have uh, automated live transcription available. Um, it's at the bottom of the screen and you can turn it on or off um, by clicking the little CC live transcript button. You can also drag and drop it around the screen. And if you're having any technical or accessibility issues, please message SOA Gallery Tech in the chat window and um, Kaylin will help you out. Um, we're gonna save Q&A for the end of the talk, um, but if you have questions, you can either type them into the chat box and Grace will address them after the presentation. Um, or at that time, you can unmute your mic or turn on your camera as well and, and ask your qu question directly. Um, we're also going to be collecting questions over on YouTube and delivering them here for Grace's consideration. Um, so if you're watching on YouTube and you have a question or comment, um, feel free to enter it into the comment section. And I think that is all from me. So uh, thank you very much for your time. And please join me in welcoming tonight's speaker, Grace Devaney. Hey everyone, um, thanks so much for the introduction, Blair. Um, and uh, I unexpectedly have my cat with me. Um, he's a frequent appear on Zooms, but um, is very involved today. Um, let me pull up my presentation and then get started. All right, so um, <clears throat> just again, to begin with thank yous, thank you, Blair, for the introduction. I'd also like to thank Jean Bor Borbridge and Kaylin Harrison um, for their assistance in facilitating this talk. Also, thank you to the interpreters um, for live interpretation. That's such an incredible service. Um, thank you for that. Um, also, as Blair did, I will offer a visual description of myself. Um, I'm a black woman in my 30s. I'm wearing a black shirt um, and gold rimmed glasses. I have a fuzzy cat sitting on my lap um, and I'm in a room with um, a geometric abstract painting behind me and some bookshelves and a poster. Um, I wanted to start this talk by saying that I am currently based in New Orleans a place that is also called Bobancha, a Choctaw term for the place of foreign languages. This name for, for Bobancha in New Orleans refers to the region's role as a port and a site of exchange for many nations, including the Homa, Ishak, Choctaw, Tunica, Biloxi, Avigel, and Natchez peoples. Um, I think it's important to acknowledge this history um, as a port city, as it also extends to the um, trade of enslaved persons um, who also built this city. Louisiana is also a place that's very close to my heart as the home of my mother's family, family's father, family line, and I'm, I'm really grateful to spend time here. Um, I've started the presentation with this picture of the Louisiana landscape because it's a kind of constant source of inspiration and um, revitalization. Um, and also as a placeholder for the work that I am doing currently, um, as Blair mentioned, I'm associate curator for Prospect New Orleans. I'm working closely with the exhibition's artistic directors, Diana Nawi and Naima J. Keith, two Los Angeles-based curators. Um, and we are putting together an exhibition that includes 51 artists and will be at venues across the city that opens on October 23rd. And I hope to see some of you there um, if, if travel allows. Um, so I can't speak much about this exhibition yet because we're revealing most of the details later on in the summer. So, but just wanted to acknowledge that that is um, why I'm currently based in New Orleans and what I'm working on. And then I also just wanted to give a quick shout out to an exhibition that I just finished organizing in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, this was a, an exhibition I did as a visiting curator for the uh, Oklahoma Visual Arts Coalition that every few years offers um, 
a juried prize to five projects. This year we supported five projects and six artists. Two of the artists were working as a collaborative duo um, and they have a year and um, a stipend to realize a significant project. I had the honor of being the juror for the last uh, round of this prize and their exhibition opened last weekend. And I had been working with them virtually over the course of the last year. And of course, um, in my busyness, I didn't take great pictures of the work, but here are a few. Um, and a, if you find yourself in the US, in, um, in Oklahoma or in the region, I recommend checking out the show that'll be on view until August. It's just an incredible group of artists who are thinking through questions related to landscape and complex notions of identity as it's shaped by their experiences in Oklahoma and also looking at histories um, related to the thriving despite displacement and despite violence of Black life in, in Tulsa and in Oklahoma in general. Um, so for the rest of this talk, I'm going to try to speak through a few images and exhibitions I've organized over the last few years and to attempt to do um, something that I always am a bit resistant to, which is to kind of give linearity and um, narrative to a series of events that kind of unfold one at a time um, and at the surface might seem disconnected, but trying to tie a thread through my practice. Um, to put it succinctly, overall, I think that um, oftentimes as I work with contemporary artists and with artworks, I'm interested in the visual and political stakes of reworking routine structures, as well as the tension between frustration and play and the possibilities that emerge through revision, reworking and reimagining anew. And I think that artists are often uniquely positioned to give form to ways of imagining otherwise. And that's something that, um, that really uh, inspires me and um, I think adds an inflection to a lot of the work that I do. Um, I wanted to start this talk with one image that I've been totally captivated by since I first saw it. Um, this is an artwork by Howardina Pendel. Howardina Pendel is um, a New York-based artist who over the last few years has really seen a kind of um, resurgence of interest in her practice despite kind of working steadily since the 1970s. Um, Howardina um, is an artist who got her MFA in Boston moved to New York and found herself in the position of being unable to find a teaching position or other forms of work to support her artistic practice. Eventually, she ends up sending out hunt, like hundreds of applications to various positions. She'll get some level of interest. She then presents herself as a young Black woman and then won't hear anything back. And it's just this kind of thing she's going through for quite some time until she finds herself in an administrative position at MoMA that ultimately um, results in her um, getting to the position of associate curator of prints and drawings by the time she leaves that institution. But she finds herself in this funny position of working as a curator while also being a practicing artist and negotiating that, um, that position of being multiply situated between those two things. Um, in addition to those forms of work, she's also really invested in anti-racist activism, activism of the civil rights movement, and also thinking through equity within cultural institutions. Um, so I mentioned this as background for talking about this photograph, which um, is a body of work she started in the early 1970s. And when I first saw it, I was just captivated by it. I wanted to understand how it was made. I wanted to understand the materiality. Um, as you can see here, the media line states that it is a photograph, um, but its, its materiality was confusing to me. You know, you can, you, I could see that it is 
based on video or a television individual image, but it has this kind of handmade quality at the same time. So after um, first learning of this photograph, um, I was able to talk to Haradina about it and she described the process of making it. And it turns out that these photographs were a side project she developed while she was working on her painting practice. Um, so just to kind of quickly describe that, I could talk about Haradina and her work all day, but I'll just kind of keep it short. But uh, around the same times that she starts making these photographs, her primary body of work is these paintings that are painter's canvas that she cuts, sews back together, and then covers with um, hole punched dots and acrylic paint. So here you can see kind of a detail of these surfaces, surfaces she's developing that are kind of in conversation with abstraction, but also relating to, to craft and, and all of these, um, these other ways of making um, that feel kind of um, outside the art world and in conversation with, with other things. So alongside developing this body of work, she also ends up making these photographs. And the impetus for this is that she is working all the time on these up close paintings, also feeling a sense of social isolation from being the only black colleague at her institution and feeling largely excluded from many things outside of work. And, um, you know, she's talked about how these are kind of a, a, a product of both her free time and like looking for ways to fill it that brought her pleasure that were satisfying um, and that, you know, kind of engaged her, her physically. Um, so she, putting that all together, um, she is feeling a lot of strain, eye strain from making these paintings and someone suggests that she gets a TV to have something at a different focal length to focus on and something that's kind of moving in the distance to rest her eyes. She, in her way, gets TV, begins watching it, and is a bit bored with what she's seeing. So she decides to start making artwork that engages with the TV. And the way she does so is developing this approach to drawing that brings together this code that she creates that feels like writing, it feels expressive, but ultimately it's not so much about um, communicating any particular thing. It's more about motion and gesture. Um, and on this slide here, on the left-hand side, you're seeing um, one image of those drawings that she's creating on acetate. And then the other one I included on the right-hand side, even though it's a slightly poor image, but to show you the kind of translucence of these drawings that she's making. So after creating these drawings, she ends up affixing them to her TV screen and then photographing the relationship between the two. So it brings this element of like chance and kind of unexpected encounter to the routine of watching TV and then becomes this kind of visual documentation of what I kind of came to see as a, a kind of conversation between herself and her hand and um, and what was appearing on TV. So these, as I mentioned, when I, um, when I saw these, I was totally captivated by them. And I think that was in part because I had had a longstanding interest in photography and lens-based practices. I had um, done most of my um, undergraduate and graduate work with a focus on photography and black artists creating, um, non-hierarchical relationships between various kinds of image making through uh, photo books. But I had not heard, I was, Pendel and her approach to photography was something that I hadn't learned about or heard about. And it just felt like it spoke to so many things I had been curious about and how people navigate the world and respond to media. Um, so my research on these led to a kind of deeper dive into television and technology in the 1970s and thinking through some other innovations that are happening at the time, such as um, the ways that television networks sought to 
caption and create words and images overlaid on live TV and thinking about her work as really engaged in this kind of conversation with new media, um, despite being largely left out of art historical narratives about that. So Howardina's work and this body of work in particular have just been this um, incredible source of interest to me and an investment I have in, in adding to and expanding upon histories of media and writing about them has become um, a part of, my, part of my work. And I also had the opportunity to think through how to display them in the exhibition of Howard Dana Penzel's work that ultimately happened at um, the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago, which is where I was working when I first discovered these. Um, just to backtrack slightly, I or I can't remember if I mentioned this, but I um, I think Blair mentioned it. Sorry, I'm getting off track. Um, I worked at the MCA for many years, and at that time, Naomi Beckwith was organizing an exhibition of Howard Dana Pindell's work, which is how I ended up learning about this kind of side project of hers. And we ended up including those in the exhibition, which opened in 2018. This is um, an installation view of that show. Um, so I think that my thinking around structure and play and the possibilities of responding to a given set of conditions um, is something that was really embodied by Howard Dean and but something that I also think about um, in the work of contemporary artists. Um, and over the next uh, 20 minutes or so, I'm just gonna give a few more examples of exhibitions that I think, even though each of them has a really different material quality, I think that they're kind of relating to this, this the political stakes I have in this idea of reworking and reimagining anew, and especially the ways that black artists engage with those stakes as they relate to um, structural racism and other things that have kind of shaped black life in the US. So um, this is a set of installation views from an exhibition I organized in 2017, um, I think, yes, 2017, with the architect Amanda Williams. Amanda is a Chicago-based architect, and she did an ex I did an exhibition with her at the MCA as a part of the Chicago Work Series, which is a series they do that focuses on work of Chicago-based artists. Um, when I approached Amanda about working on this exhibition, she was developing a body of work that focused on gold, and thinking through gold as a material that can be both real and fake, can have value that is kind of um, literal and decided upon by our economic structure, but also can be um, made an imitation and have appearance. So it was this material that allowed her to think through value in a really capacious way. And she was also thinking deeply about the history of bricks in Chicago. So Chicago is a city that um, had its own kind of brick laying and its own culture of bricks um, that shaped the city. And um, a lot of times um, in the neighborhood in which Amanda was working at the time, which was Inglewood, there would be houses that would be demolished and the bricks that they were made up would be considered to have more valuable than the standing house. Um, so she was thinking about this issue of like salvage and um, what it means when we value materials more than the lives and livelihoods and communities that are um, based in a place. So with all of Amanda's thinking about Chicago and the South Side and these histories, um, the question became how to translate that to an institutional space that is in a neighborhood that is um, one of the more well-resourced spaces in Chicago and how to kind of think about that process of translation of one space into another within the city. 
And Amanda's approach to that, which I think of, you know, oftentimes I think the role of curators and in institutions is being a mediator and a translator for um, ambitious goals that an artist has for their work. And this project was one that really allowed me to step into that. Something that Amanda wanted to do was to physically change the space of the, the gallery and create architectural interventions that would um, be a bit disruptive to common uses and experiences of the space. So one of the ways she sought to do that was to create this, this artwork, which she called She's Mighty Mighty, Just Letting It All Hang Out, a reference to the song Brick House. Um, and this artwork, we um, employed a brick mason to build a wall in the gallery. So what you're seeing here, that gold wall is normally an entrance, entrance into that gallery. But Amanda bricked it in and then covered it in gold leaf. So creating this kind of um, disruption to the space that changed the flow and kind of reawakened people to questions around access and, and entry. Um, another work that she uh, created for the show was actually um, an adjacent one to the brick wall I was just describing. It's hard to see in this slide, but um, if you can see on the, um, the right-hand side, there's like a small lit object on the wall. So that's the backside of the gold wall and embedded into the wall is um, a jar of ultra sheen. So this is a color that she, ultra sheen hair dress, which is a kind of hair grease. And she was interested in bringing this in and kind of equating it with one of these bricks to again, think through these questions of value and structure and, and how value gets built and maintained. Um, the last um, piece of this exhibition that I'll speak about, which is kind of in keeping with what I was describing earlier, but um, at a slightly different scale, was the creation of a room that is the size of a typical Chicago lot, or excuse me, not the size, the scale of a typical Chicago lot, so proportionate to a Chicago lot. And this room um, was gilded by a group of collaborators and friends that Amanda has worked with um, and who live in Inglewood, the neighborhood that Amanda, um, Amanda's practice at this time was kind of focused on. And um, together they gold leafed the room and then sealed it off. So this kind of very direct way of shifting questions of access. So visitors to the exhibition could look into the room and see this gilded space. Um, and the idea was to kind of create this installation that, that raised questions around who has access to property and property ownership um, by disrupting the space of the gallery. Um, another exhibition I worked on slightly after this, but I think felt really in keeping with these questions around structure and how to question things that are limiting and at times feel arbitrary, um, but are so kind of baked into the everyday. Um, that came, that, that thinking kind of reached an apotheosis in this exhibition, Direct Message, Art, Language, and Power, that opened in October of 2019. This exhibition was rooted in the MCA collection. So, um, you know, one of the things about um, being an institutional curator with a collection that was both an opportunity and a challenge is that there's this whole kind of set of objects that you are tasked with working with, which, um, you know, on one hand, I think is an incredible opportunity and one that I feel so grateful for, but it speaks to the, um, the institutional blind spots and limitations that have shaped a narrative through objects over the course of years. So oftentimes um, with collections, especially in the US and likely elsewhere, they're often dominated by white male artists and the, um, the diversity of perspectives um, can be limited. So 
for this um, exhibition, I was thinking through these questions around language and structure and um, how artists intervene on media um, and try to imagine it anew. And my thinking for that ended up leading me to some incredible language-based and conceptual artworks in the MCA's collection. So on the um, right-hand side of the slide, you're seeing a work by Jenny Holzer that was um, commissioned by the MCA in 2008 and hadn't been shown since then. So part of the work of this project was um, working with our, the museum's registrars and technicians to um, restore this piece and show it again. And then um, on the left-hand side is um, one of the other entry points to the room that um, features a work by Gary Simmons that is also in the MCA collection. Um, so I thought that um, to talk about this exhibition a little bit, I might just go through some um, pairings of artworks and kind of um, some, some groups of artworks that speak to my thinking as I worked through a collection and also kind of trying to imagine other ways of creating a narrative around um, media and language-based art. So to that end, what you're seeing in this slide is and in the background are three paintings by Paul Tech, um, an artist who is represented in the MCA collection. His paintings, um, I mean, he worked in a, in a diversity of ways. Um, he's, um, he's an artist who was based in New York, traveled often, um, and he made paintings when he was traveling on newspapers, or he would, um, he would take the day's newspaper and paint over it a kind of like personal scene or response to the news. Um, I think these paintings are incredible and, and interesting and, and so striking, um, but I wanted to think through this process of like removing or changing or altering the news and, and look at how artists were working on that um, more expansively. So one way I thought about expanding this was um, including the work of Sebrin Bierstie, an artist who um, has a digital project. So what you're seeing on the left and right hand side are actually the same screen over the course of a day. Um, and this project was um, a, a computer program that paints over the New York Times over the course of the day using um, the colors from the front page. So again, like, you know, thinking through, um, thinking through the same, a similar kind of um, thing that Paul Tech is thinking through, but um, through artificial, uh, artificial intelligence might be an extreme word, but through this algorithm and through, um, you know, a computer generated painting that's kind of covering the news. Um, and then more in keeping with my kind of focus and roots as an art historian, I wanted to include um, a range of artists that were thinking those questions as it related to Black political thought and Black history. Um, so one of the artists um, whose work was not in the collection um, that we were able to borrow from the Southside Community Art Center is Ralph Arnold's Unfinished Collage, which is a work that honors John F. K. Robert F. Kennedy and Martin Luther King, each of whom was assassinated in 1968 at the height of the civil rights era. Um, and this work kind of collages popular culture images of them all onto this three section panel. And ultimately he called this work unfinished collage because um, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but the um, panel over here, um, is blank. It kind of, there's this fourth section that kind of implies leaving space for future political violence. So there's, you know, what we now see is this um, well-founded pessimism about the direction um, that the civil rights movement and political violence were heading 
but I really, um, I wanted to bring this kind of historic work into conversation about, you know, thinking about what these reworkings of media can do and, and also something that was a nice kind of point for me as I pursued this one, I learned that this work actually was initially shown in 1968 at the MCA um, as a part, of, a part of an exhibition titled Violence in Recent American Art. So it was kind of an exciting opportunity to, to um, bring this object back to this institution and to kind of situate it alongside a collection and to um, imagine its place within, within other objects from the same time period and others that, that were collected. Um, and it's also just incredible that this, um, this artwork still lives in Chicago. So that was a really um, great opportunity. Oh, and I should also say that I, I learned of this piece through an incredible exhibition of his work at the Museum of Contemporary Photography in Chicago as well. So definitely um, this interest in Chicago and its history is, is kind of held throughout the city in a way that's really, really beautiful. Um, some other artists that I brought into this conversation around news and media and rethinking it included Alexander Bell. Um, Alexander Bell is a New York-based artist who trained as a journalist and she um, initially began making works such as the one you're seeing here um, as public artworks that were trying to think through media coverage. So for um, Alexander Bell, she's interested in kind of arguing back with content, questioning the way something's written, and then um, redoing it in a way that acknowledges those concerns. Um, so that is a quote from Alexandra about her reworking of news um, and what she's doing with this um, redacted and reimagined cover of the New York Times um, and the coverage of Michael Brown. So another artist that I wanted to bring into conversation is Lorraine O'Grady. Um, she is um, an artist who has been, again, working steadily since the 70s. Um, she is the daughter of Caribbean immigrants who grew up in Boston. Um, and this work that you're seeing here, it's the work in the background, in the foreground, there's a reflection of a William Kentridge piece in the front. Um, but this work um, is based on poetry, essentially, that she made from the public language of newspapers. Um, it's a body of work that she has described as a ceaseless conversation of difference um, that comes from the desire to tell your own stories, not just to understand yourself, but to understand the world. Um, and in this body of work, she's kind of taking collages that she's made in this way from the 1970s and putting them in conversation with newer works from 2017. So what I loved about this was this kind of this, um, this historic work, but how Lorraine O'Grady herself is revisiting her archive and kind of updating things. So almost in, in the absence of having visibility around these works at the time they were made, she's kind of creating her own archive for them, and like this kind of literal conversation um, with herself, you know, that I thought was really compelling and kind of another take on this way of reworking, rethinking um, media. Um, another aspect of the show that um, I was really um, excited to include were artists who are thinking through um, public language by considering redaction. Um, on this slide here, in the back, you're seeing a work by Jamal Cyrus, which is a part of his um, reversed redacted drawing series that are taking um, documents from the FBI surveillance program that was active between 1956 and 1971 that surveyed and disrupted um, the actions of um, many kinds of political activists, um, activists in the civil rights movement, people who were um, advocating for socialism, 
even, and some people who are just perceived as being um, socialist or communist sympathizers um, in this kind of culture of surveillance. So Jamal, um, Jamal uh, is these, he makes these works by um, starting with those um, documents that have now been made public, but are heavily redacted. And then he kind of further removes all content and reverses it. So the um, parts of the document that are hidden are now the kind of brighter white areas. And then the, um, the charcoal is those removals. So again, I think it's like this, it's taking this, this structure and what we're given um, and reversing the terms of it, um, kind of highlighting the ways that power operates in ways that we can't always see or know, but making that absence um, kind of visible. And um, I was interested in thinking about this work alongside um, this three channel video by Stan Douglas, which is in the Van Say's collection that was looking to news cycles in 1969 and 1970 um, and thinking about the development of Happy Talk, which is a news format um, that is quite common. And Stan Douglas was thinking about this as a response, like a kind of hysterical response to the news of the 1960s um, and this way of kind of um, um, glossing over and simplifying issues of um, civil dissent with these kind of theatrical means. Um, and around the time that I was <clears throat> putting this exhibition together, um, it was leaked that the FBI was currently surveilling the actions of black activists um, and identifying um, people in the Black Lives Matter movement and other movements as black identity extremists. So again, as I was um, mentioning with Ralph Arnold that this like, um, this thinking through a future with this object and the kinds of um, desire to rework structure despite the kind of repeating actions ended up kind of playing out in real time as I was thinking through these, these um, historic and contemporary artworks. And um, as a part of the programming for this exhibition, there was a conversation with um, two lawyers working on media and um, questions of surveillance with Jamal Cyrus to kind of bring these questions to show the ways that these questions are not just things that unfold in the gallery, but also relate to issues um, of policy and gover governance. Um, the last exhibition I will talk about has a very different visual appearance than the previous ones, I think, but to my mind feels um, related in some ways to this, this um, idea that I mentioned at the top, this kind of interest I have in disrupting structure and thinking anew about, um, about the, the, the routines that we um, are often live with that are received and kind of we haven't had a hand in shaping. So Christina Quarles is a Los Angeles-based painter who um, describes her work as being about um, painting the experience of existing in the body. And for Christina, as a biracial cisgendered woman um, who is queer, but um, her, basically she is painting from an experience of being multiply situated between identities, um, but often feeling like the, the impetus to be kind of fully legible within one identity position or another is um, not only not accessible to her, but not something that she's interested in. She's really, um, she's really invested in the possibilities of being multiply situated um, and finding a new path through the world from, from that position. And I think that as far as her paintings go, um, some, the thing that drew me to them um, initially was how, uh, how 
bodily they were, not just in terms of like representing what a body in motion or what two bodies look like, but what it feels like to exist in a body and what um, what intimacy with both environment and others can start to feel like the kind of merging and collapsing um, and also the ways in which that that can be um, a source of pleasure, but also um, the kind of fraught nature of, of closeness and touch um, and the violence that it um, is sometimes connected with. So this exhibition, um, it just opened at the MCA um, in March. And it, um, yeah, it was an exploration of her paintings um, that was, was looking at the ways that she paints identity and relationship to environment and um, these, these kinds of ways that she's seeking to um, break down routine structures and boundaries quite literally through the expressive capacity of the figures in her paintings. Um, and then another kind of um, tie-in with the other bodies of work I was showing or the other exhibitions I was showing is um, Christina is an artist who's deeply interested in, it, deeply interested in language and um, playing with language. And um, her work often includes like, her, her um, drawings often include language and song lyrics. And then this installation, which we um, showed for the first time um, since she had made it, includes like bits of text embedded into the environment um, and this kind of mix of wordplay and visuality just on like a kind of material level, I think is something that I'm, I'm interested in. But um, I think for Christina, it's really about, um, it's about kind of challenging distinctions between thought and um, affect and um, various ways of being that are kind of thought to be separate and like all of the the power and possibility that comes from kind of breaking through these boundaries and structures um, as they relate to self and to how we relate to one another. Um, so those are the exhibitions that I was hoping to talk through. Uh, last time I ran through this, it took me much longer. So I may have left some things out, um, but I'm happy to open this up for questions um, or to talk about anything else in um, more detail. <laughs>